But before we get into the message, we're, let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for today. We thank you for all the blessings that you have lined up purposely in our lives that we will receive today, Lord. So I just feel it upon my heart, Lord God, to pray, not for blessings, but I want to pray that each and every one of us in this room has the eyes to see you, the ears to hear you, and the heart to know you, Lord God, that we can see you in all things that we do, so that when we take a step back in our prayer and our special secret place with you, that we are praying and knowing the blessings that you are doing in our lives. Lord, you know everything that we need. We may pray for everything that we want, but you know the specific need at the specific time. So, Lord, we just pray for our hearts to be open to understand that need that you have given us so that we don't override the blessing and miss it, Father God. And if we do, Lord, we just repent and we just ask for your forgiveness for not seeing you and your glory in all of our situations. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right. So I had probably like five titles to this message. <laughs> and... um. The message, you will, I guarantee you, you're going to be like, that title doesn't even make sense to what I'm going to be preaching today. But you know what? It does. I'm saying that. Because, actually we'll get to it. But today's message is strength under control. Strength under control. Do we know what strength is? Am I, do I have strength? If, let's pretend for a second that this light was... I'm a, I'm a pretty ripped guy, so we're going to say 500 pounds, right? And I can do this. Am I strong? That's strength, right? I'm not ripped, by the way. I used to be in high school. Not anymore. Um, but if this was strong, I, you know, I, I must be pretty strong if I can lift a 500-pound light with my, my finger. That's strength, right? Physical strength, right? Can I use that strength? To get through a situation if my dad dies? Can I use that strength for any bad situation in my life that causes issues in my life? No. Now, if I needed to lift a car, I could use that. My dad's not dead. Let me clarify that. Um, but it's an analogy, right? Because we have physical strength. But the strength that we're going to talk about is spiritual strength. See, spiritual strength is really important because in the Bible, God doesn't straight out and say, you need to be strong spiritually or you're going to die. He doesn't say that, right? But what he does say that, and the word that he uses is meekness, right? He does say, blessings be unto the meek who inherit the kingdom, Right? That's very powerful. That's a very powerful blessing. So why do I have the title, Strength Under Control? Well, let's talk about, this is really actually a definition by a philosopher, Aristotle. Aristotle defined meekness as strength under control. It's a perfect definition. Perfect definition. It doesn't give the full meaning of meekness, let's be clear on that, but is it a perfect definition of what it means to be meek? Is to have your strength under control. Now, does that mean that my strength should be under control of the Father, or do I need to control my strength under myself? So that's what we're going to get into. Because if, if your first mind goes, well, yeah, I may be super strong and I can lift this, but um, if my strength was under control, I wouldn't lift this if it wasn't meaningless, right? If I didn't actually have to lift this, I'm just wasting energy lifting this, right? See, we do a lot of that in our spiritual strength. We tend to lift things that is not for us to lift, right? And being meek, meek in character, helps define when to do that. Okay, so let's look at some definitions because I want to define meekness a little bit more than just Aristotle's definition of meekness. Because 
when somebody hears meek, I used to think that meekness is the same thing as humility. It, humility is a synonym of meekness. But I don't think they're the same. I think that meekness is a direct correlation of humility, and humility is a direct correlation of meekness, but they're one of different. Now, when you read in your Bible, there's a lot of translations that replace the word meekness with humility, and the same translations replace humility with meekness because they're very close. So to be humble is an attitude of self-awareness. There goes my bad handwriting again. Is an attitude of self-awareness and modesty where one decreases themselves to make room for another. Right? The exact opposite of pride. Right? If I was going to say the definition of pride, which I don't have it written down yet, but we all know what pride is. Pride is putting oneself above everyone else. Right? Pride is nothing can go wrong in my life. And the reason why things go wrong in my life is because it's everybody else's fault, especially his. That's pride. That's not true. So being humble is an attitude of self-awareness where one decreases themselves to make room for another. See, I love humility because, um, um, who was his name? The author of Good Morning, Holy Spirit. Thank you. I know the book. I'm bad with, for some reason, it's people's names. I struggle with people's names. Like, I can remember your accolades and what you have done, but when I try to remember you, and I know your face, like, I can picture, I have a picture memory, I can see your face, but I can't put a name there. But, Benny Hinn? See, I just forgot again. Okay. He, there's a very amazing, if you haven't read the book, Good Morning, Holy Spirit, I recommend you read it. It is fantastic. Um, and read it multiple times a year because it's a refresher. But he puts in that book how so many people pray for the Holy Spirit being infilling and infilling and infilling. Fill me up, 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 fill me up. But they're not ready to push out their bad. They expect the Holy Spirit to fill you up. And he makes this very clear where if you were humble, you would already remove and make room for him. See, he's already there to fill you up, but he needs you to make room. He needs you to remove the wickedness from you. And then he will fill you. And you don't need a special prayer to fill him. When you're in his presence and you, you know, we were just at altar here. I guarantee the people sending this altar decreased themselves today. And he just came in like a rushing bowl. He goes, yep, room is there. I'm filling the void. Right? He beckons the call. People ask, how, how do I give my burdens to him? Well, you, you just give it up. It's, it's as simple as that. You stand at the altar and, Lord, take it. Take it. Right? Amen. That's what he does. He fills that void. So that's humility, to be humble. But what about meekness? Meekness and this is a more bigger definition. A disposition to be patient and long-suffering and to treat others with kindness and goodness. Also, also to be open to learn from others. Specifically, in the biblical definition, is to be always open to learn God's wisdom and His Word. Because we like to read on paper, but we don't like to apply the wisdom, right? So we always need to be open, open to God's word. So if you have a character of meekness, you also have humility in your character. Does that make sense? Because meekness is a disposition to be patient and long-suffering. What does that mean? What does long-suffering mean? Well, let's think about it this way. If I am waiting for something to, you know what, I'm going to do it like this, because this actually was recent in a testimony. 
my wife and I was recently in a battle with our insurance company because of stuff on the roof. And um, they really messed, up, messed us over. So um, they sent us a check and said, this is how much that you're going to get. And it barely covered me doing the roof and finishing everything. Um, and I'm like, I really need to cash this because we are short on everything. We need this money, right? But we knew, we prayed and knew from God that the right choice was to fight this. The right choice was to get what we deserve and allow God to work. I could have cashed that check. By the way, if anybody knows, if I would have cashed that check, that is an agreement to the settlement. If I would have cashed that check and we went to litigation, that would have been, the court would have ruled that I accepted the settlement and it would have been thrown out, right? But we didn't. We held true to what God has said to us. And we, thank God we weren't late. We, we, you know, we decided to do some financial moving and it was good. Um, but ultimately what happened was, is we contacted a, a lawyer that God has given me and we got the full settlement. Praise God. We suffered long for that full settlement. And not only that, is we can repay all of the debt that we gained for doing our roof. And God bless us even more that we can pay off more debt so we can further advance God's kingdom, right? That is what we're looking for. That is long-suffering. So if I wasn't humble, I would have tried and fought and did everything that I would have done in that situation. But I knew this was God's design. This is the, one of the first times we had to dealt with a situation like this where I took a step back and I said, you know what, Lord? You are, you are directing the train on this. Whatever you tell us to do, we're going to do it. And we know your grace is going to flow in all situations. So, long-suffering, that is just one example. And we can go all day and give examples to our meekness. To some people, by not stepping up and yelling at my insurance company, might see that as a sign of weakness. That I didn't take matters in my own hands. That I didn't force my way through the situation. And we can all, we all have an experience in our lives that would have done that. See, the worldview of meekness is weakness. Mark that down. That's a quote. I don't know who said it, but it wasn't me. I know somebody said that already. But the worldview of weakness, sorry, of meekness is weakness. That is not what God says. See, God says, blessings to those who are meek of the heart, you will inherit the kingdom of God. And that's when Aristotle comes out with that definition of meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength under control. See, I can, I can attribute meekness as the opposite action of being prideful. Same with humility. Because meekness with long-suffering is we're going to wait it out. Jesus waited it out 40 days. Jesus waited it out all the temptations of Satan. He sat there and goes, no, I got my sword, and I'm going to battle you and pray you with the scriptures of my Father, and this is what the truth is. I don't need that rock to turn the bread because I have nourishment from the Father. I don't need the kingdom because you know what, Satan? I'm bringing the kingdom. Right? He waited it out. He applied his strength. And this is what I love about it. You know, Jesus is God. I like the picture of that situation where Jesus is walking around, right? And Satan is there manifesting himself. And he's saying, look what I can do. Jesus is God. He could have just been like, oh, now you're gone. He didn't do that. He had a controlled reaction to the situation. Right? A controlled reaction. He had strength under control. Psalms 37, verse 11 says, The meek will inherit the land and delight in abundant shalom, or peace, if we don't know what shalom means. Meekness is not putting your own understandings ahead of God's understandings. Meekness is leaning on His understanding, and this is the important part, being available to listen to him. 
right? What did we learn about what humble is? Being humble is decreasing yourself. That's not just inwardly, that's outwardly too. If we are dedicating all of our time to work and all the things that aren't glorifying God, you're not dedicating time and removing things from your life to allow him to speak to you because you are so flooded with everything else. How can you hear him with that static going on in your brain? I couldn't. I couldn't. Right? It's impossible. When I was a kid, I used to, we didn't have a whole lot of money. So my favorite thing was to have the television on with the black and white static and see which one won. I'm still waiting for that battle to come to fruition. Right? That's what I picture when we're so full of it. Right? There's a reason why it's black and white. Right? In our heads, we're trying to allow room for God, but at the same time, the enemy is throwing that black static in our lives where we just can't hear him. But he doesn't control that situation. Satan has no control over that. What did Tori Lynn prophesy? It's time to speak up. Right? Satan, no more. Get out. James 1, verse 21. And I'm, I'm going to say these. I'm going to get, get to the main verse that I'm going to get to, and we'll, we'll go to there. Um, uh, James chapter 1, verse 21. Um, this is the TLV. So put away all moral filth and excess of evil and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. Why would in James say the implanted word? Because in order to be implanted, somebody has to implant it, right? It, he's talking that it was implanted as in past tense. It's already there. So put away all moral filth, which means that all morality away from God, God is our plumb line of morality. Do we understand that? All morality comes from Him. So if it's away from Him, it's filth. Sorry, another thing's coming to me. I'm sidetracking here. Before I came to God, I used to play so many video games. So many. And it ruled my life. I remember living in Madison, um, playing, uh, I'm just going to say it, World of Warcraft, right? Um, wow. And uh, I used to play it so much. I know Arrow remembers all this, that our schedule was defined by my rating times, right? Because I was professional at it. Yeah, I'm going to say that because my, I got called to do what I needed to do in the game, and my life got ruled on that. And so that was a huge addiction of mine was video games, all of it. I played all of it. I, I was, you know, I didn't discriminate against video games. And then the day came where... I got saved, and I still played games, but I got saved, and it wasn't the fact of playing video games was the sin. It was the fact that video games controlled me, which was the sin, right? And then I hear God says, hey, hey, hey son, I need you to stop. I need you to step away from that, and I need you to see what I have on the other side of the fence for you. Right? So, as you can imagine, somebody with full addiction, it takes a long time to realize that you have an addiction, right? It's like being in the, the meetings, hi, my name is Tim, I'm addicted to video games, right? You have to recognize and admit that you have an addiction. But then, as God called me, I started to um, move one, like, <laughs> so what's over here? Right? And at one point, I just had to make a choice. I had to make a choice to either fall and do the splits and hurt myself forever because men aren't made to do that, <laughs> right? Or choose one side. Choose one side, right? And I, you know, we watched the movie The Forge for Sons of Promise, and I remember him in, that, in the room saying, you know, 
I choose as the Lord is my Lord or you're not my Lord. Lord, you're my Lord or you're not my Lord. See, there's no gray area. So I remember, I didn't have that exact words, but that was the feeling. It was, okay, I'm going to choose. You saved me from so much and saved my marriage. And I'm going to let this be a problem. Lord, I choose you. Right? I chose to decrease myself. See, that's one of those moments where like, how do you decrease yourself? Well, it's a choice. Choose God. Right? See, that moral filth. Again, the video games wasn't the sin. It was that video games was my life and God wanted to be my life. Right? Receive with meekness the implanted word. See, the word's already implanted, everybody. God says in my new covenant, in my new contract, everybody will know me because my words will be already implanted on the inside of your heart. Right? That's what that's referring to. God's word is already here. It's already here. But we have so much junk in the trunk of our hearts. Right? that we just can't see it. We can't see it. So, receive with meekness the already implanted word which is able to save your soul. The Savior is already here. Right now. See, when we choose that, I used to think this was like, man, I'm down in the dumps. I'm going to play some video games. And then I rage quit because I'm mad at my video games. You remember that. If I would get bored, how much destruction would I would do? That's my friend over there. But when I chose this side, there is a sense of joy that you receive with a meek heart that I didn't even know was Scripture. Right? Isaiah 29.19 says, The meek will add to their joy and add an eye and the needy of, humil of humility will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. So when you have a meek heart, God just floods His joy. Praise Him. Right? So if you're down in the dumps, what do you need to get rid of? The cure for being down. The cure for being down is get rid of something that you know you're not supposed to do and spend time with God. All will be healed. All will be saved. In Jesus' name. But here's the question that, after learning all this, right, strength under control, and we're going to get to that, but how do you know when you are truly humble and meek? Because we're not Moses. Moses is the only one in the Bible that says, hey, by the way, guys, I'm the most humble person. <laughs> the irony, right? But he was humble. That was the truth. But if I were to go out and say, hey, what's your name? Hey, Tyler. My name is Tim. I'm really humble. You'll like me. You're full of it. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work that way, guys. We can't just proclaim, I'm humble. So how do we know when somebody's humble? How do we know when somebody has a meek of heart? Because meekness is a character of God. Humility is a character of God. If you're a Christian... You better be walking in this. Otherwise, you have issues that you need to work with God with. Some black static is preventing you from doing this. So how do we know when somebody we meet is truly humble? Or how do we know ourselves? We know by looking at what Jesus did. See, Jesus also didn't go out and say, I'm humble. Jesus showed through actions of his true character. See, the Bible says that we don't know what's in our heart. Only God knows. We can't be the judges of our own heart. Right? So when we sit down and really spend time with God, 
and we sit down and say, I'm just going to, I'm going to see what's truly in my heart, it's impossible. But when you sit down and say, Lord, show me, show me what's in my heart. And then the next step that we always miss is to understand and listen, right? We need to not just understand and listen, but when we listen, we're like, oh, that's too hard, right? So our hearts, if you really want to know what's in your hearts, is your heart will always come out in the situations. What's in your heart will always come out in turmoil. What's in your heart will always come out when you are truly, truly burdened in life. So if your reaction to your burden and your turmoil is morally wicked, guess what? There's wickedness in your heart. We're all fallen. Don't be down on yourself. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. We all know this. But only He can help you remove that. So when we, how do we know we're truly humble and we're truly have a heart of meekness is when we walk through our actions in meekness. See, I truly believe, and I'm going to see where I'm going to get to this, is if you are a servant of God, you have a meek heart. If you truly, truly dedicate your life to be a disciple of Christ, not just saying I'm a Christian. There's a difference between saying that you're a Christian and walking like a Christian. Christians need to be walking like Christians. See, that's why everybody hates Christians. Let's be honest with each other. Let's be honest with each other. So how do we know that we're servants of God and why is being a servant so important with a meek heart? It is, if you have a meek heart, I'm sorry, it's impossible to not be a servant. If you have meekness in your heart, you are truly decreasing yourself to serve others. That's what Christ calls us to do. So let's go to this verse, Matthew chapter 20. We're going to take a walk. Verse 20 through 28. I'll be reading out of the TLV. Matthew chapter 20, starting in verse 20. We're going to go through 28. I love this story. Because if you want to learn, I don't know if this is something you can learn. Jesus shuts down pride so fast in this story, it's like a lightning strike. Which is funny because it follows the Bonerges, which is the Sons of Thunder. All right. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came with her sons to Yeshua, and she was kneeling down and asking something from him. What do you want? He said to her. She said to him, Declare that these two sons of mine might sit, one at your right and one at your left in your kingdom. But Yeshua replied, You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? We are able they said to him, they as in the Bonerges. He said to them, You shall indeed drink my cup, but to sit at on my right and left, this isn't mine to grant. Rather, it's for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. Keep it chaste. Remember that. Remember those words. It is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. Now when the ten heard, they became indignant with the two brothers. But Yeshua called them over and said, You know that the rulers of the nations lord over them, and their great ones play the tyrant over them. It shall not be this way among you, but whoever wants to be great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. I didn't hear or read the single word of humility or meekness in that entire scripture. But you felt the action. 
in that. See, Jesus not only did a lot of things in that. He shut down pride with love. He prophesied to the two brothers. What did he say? You will drink my cup. Right? This is a prophecy to the all twelve. Right? And then he says, I know that you're asking to be at my left and my right, but only the Father can choose those spots. And he goes into directly how those spots are being chosen, as in even the Son of Man did not come to serve, but the choice is or not to be served, but to serve. See, Jesus walked and completely, as the Son of Man, He could have done many things, but He chose to separate everything, as we know this, to be perfect, blameless. How could you do that? I'm just, how can you, you know from the beginning the cup that you're going to bear? How many of us in this room would know that if I made this decision tomorrow, I would forfeit my life. You don't have to raise your hand, but I know like we're all humans and a lot of us won't do it. It's okay. But Jesus knowing what, what was at stake and his purpose, he did that for us. The perfect servant who walked blameless and without reproach, who never shied from the cup that was given to him, who ultimately gave himself for us to have eternal life through him so that we could also be with the Father. See, that's a tall order to fill. The sons of thunder didn't know what they were asking. And I truly believe that the sons of thunder were in that moment of being persuaded to ask for it. Because what, what mom would not want their son to have an amazing life? Or dad, right? She wanted to make sure that their seats were planted, that they got something out of it. That was a very prideful statement. But God lifted them up and says, there's a possibility but you need to serve. You need to serve others. See, I love this because, I'm going to, one more step before I keep going on, is that he knew that they were going to drink his cup. See, that was the easy part where I think God was saying, drinking the cup of the Lord is the easy part, but decreasing yourself to serve others, that's the hard part. Being meek of the heart, that's the hard part. James 3.13 in the NLT says, If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with humility that comes from wisdom. So let's talk about the good works. Let's talk about our strength under control. Guys, that was just the intro. I'm kidding. We're about halfway through. <laughs> See, I'm going to tie back to the the Matthew chapter 20 where Jesus says, I was not sent to be served. He was sent the king and the Lord of the kingdom, but he didn't have the mindset to be served. He flat out says, I'm going to serve you. So let's think about their walk for a second with the 12 disciples. Does that mean that the 12 disciples never cooked Jesus any food or anything like that? No. They had to have, I mean, obviously he was their teacher, teacher, right? They were providing and cooking them food and you know, doing stuff for him. And Jesus had to have allowed that stuff to happen as, the, you know, part of the caravan that they had. But he didn't call a slave to serve him. He didn't call people to wash him. He didn't call people to do that. But there were a few moments in the Bible where Jesus allowed himself to be served. And this is where my true revelation came um, out of house fire because, you know, we 
haven't had it in two weeks. And we're finally getting to talk about the chapter we've been reading for three weeks now. And this chapter involves what I'm going to call the saints of meekness. We're going to talk about the saints of meekness because we're going to learn from them and what it truly means to have a humble heart and what it truly means to walk in that because I, I know I could be wrong, but I picked three times in the Bible where Jesus was served and I'm going to give an honorable mention to a fourth who was a saint of humility. So the first one is Mary, the mother of Jesus. You can't have Jesus, son of man, without Mary. Now, if Mary would have said no, there would have been Elena, whoever, right? Because Jesus calls, and he, there are always going to be somebody to fill a need. But Mary, a woman who received the first grace of Jesus when he came as son of man, fully surrendered to God's call. Let's think about that for a second. We all know the story of Mary, and if, if we don't, we're going to learn a little bit today, is that Mary, unmarried, a virgin, and an angel comes to her room, and she's betrothed, by the way, and angel comes to her room and says, hey, God has chosen you, by the way, to have a baby, and you're going to name him Jesus. Can you, as, okay, women, can you imagine that? Just picture that, be like, uh, um, because what we don't know is, is that women who are betrothed and are virgins, that if in that betrothal, and they break their commitment to being a virgin, the law states that they can be stoned to death. So there was a lot riding on her saying yes. Right? But God knew her heart. God knew Mary was the one. God knew what she would say. And through I mean, we always got to know, like, her mind is probably real and like, ah, ah. Uh, but she know where her heart was, right? Yes. Lord, I will do this for you. Make a way. And she said yes. God entrusted Mary because Mary had the heart of humility and the heart of meekness to raise the Son of God and the Son of Man up to maturity to walk this earth. He chose that woman. A saint of meekness. My second saint, and these are ranked, and these are my rankings of there's I mean, there's not one greater than the other, right? God loves us all, but as a as a human, I I, I got rankings here. So number two is the sinful woman in Luke chapter seven, verse thirty six through fifty. I'm going to go to that and I'm going to read it for you guys. Now, let's, when we read this, let's truly have that heart of what does this truly mean? Why, is, why did this story of this woman get put in God's Scripture? Because there is no Scripture in here that is important to be left out. There's a reason for it. There's a reason for it to study every word. To the two, to the B, to the eyes, right? There's a reason for it and understanding it. So Luke chapter 7, verse 36. Now one of the Pharisees was asking Yeshua if he would eat with him. Upon entering the Pharisee's home, he reclined at the table. And behold, a woman in the town who was a sinner when she discovered that Yeshua was reclining at the Pharisee's home, brought an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to drench his feet with tears and kept wiping them with her head of hair. Then she was kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. Now when the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this were a prophet, he would know what sort of woman is touching him that she's a sinner. And answering, Yeshua said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, Say it, teacher. A moneylender with two de debtors 
One owed him 500 denarii. Denarii. Denarii, excuse me. Dyslexia, you're kind of kicking in right there. I'm kidding, I don't have that. But over a money lender who had two debtors, one owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. When neither could repair, repay him, he canceled both debts. So which of them would love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Yeshua said. Turning toward the, towards the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered into your house, and you didn't give me water for my feet. But she has drenched my feet with tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time she entered, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I tell you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but the one who is, who is forgiven little loves little. He then said to her, Your sins have been forgiven. But those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to one another, Who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in shalom. Imagine that for a second. I'm going to use this, uh, an outside story, and I, I wish John Pavelski was here because he would have kicked out of this because I'm using him in this story. So John Pavelski, he's the Portage County clerk for Portage County, right? Let's imagine, let's kind of correlate the story as John being a Pharisee, right? He's in political office. A Pharisee in that culture was a political, kind of a political office, a religious office. This is like Donald Trump calling John up and saying, hey, John, I want to have dinner with you. I've heard you're doing a really good job. Let's have dinner at your house, right? And then this is like somebody in the far left saying, oh, my God, Donald Trump is coming and barging in this house, right, and praising Donald Trump for what he did. This sinner crashed the party. This sinner was not invited. This sinner knew in her heart to wash Jesus' feet with her tears. Not only that, is a woman's hair is their sign of beauty, remains covered. She uncovers her hair and cleans his feet. She decreases herself and rubs her humil- her. her Beauty all over the floor for Jesus. She says, I'm nothing without him. That is that action, that meekness. And what does she get out of it, right? What, is, what does Jesus say? Blessed are the meek of heart who inherit the kingdom of God. And what is the last statement that he says in this? He says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. She gained her inheritance her faith in Jesus as the Messiah. Now the next saint is Miriam, Mary, Lazarus' sister, in John 12, 1-7. through A very similar story, but this one, she spends a whole bunch of money on the best oil possible. Now, we know these are two different stories because it doesn't say that she cried over Jesus' feet. What she does is she dumps this oil, 300 denarii worth of oil, all on Jesus' feet. And then she does the same thing. She removes the covering of her hair and dries his feet. A woman humble of heart. A woman through her action shows what is on her heart. And one thing... I love about Miriam is that she also defines the other definition of meekness because we talked that meekness is right is being open to hear God's word. I she sure made Martha pretty mad that one day. Right? As the women of the household to serve the guests coming in, right? 
Mary's heart wanted to be at the feet of Jesus to listen to his word, right? To get away from the cultural norms. See, to be meek, I love this because this is a true statement. First Mary, then Martha. Remember that. First Mary, hear God's word. Then Martha, serve, right? First Mary, then Martha. So first Mary sat at the feet of Jesus with a humble heart to listen to him. And Jesus, at the same time, kind of exalted Mary in front of Martha, saying, Martha, Martha, what are you doing? Right? She knows where she has to be. And you're just sitting there feeding people that don't need food right now. I'm feeding them. I'm giving them spiritual nourishment. Right? That's a paraphrase. That's not scriptural. First Mary, then Martha. A heart of meekness requires a heart of listening, decreasing, and then serving. Now, my honorable mention of a heart, a saint of humility, you can write this down as in Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. So Luke 17, verses 11 through 19. We don't know his name. But in this story, Jesus, they're walking, and there's ten lepers. Right? Jesus heals them all, and he says, go to the temple of the saints, wash yourselves, and be clean. And then they do that. One of them rushes back to Jesus. Praise you, O Lord, you healed me. All glory to you. And you know what Jesus says? Wait, wasn't there ten of you? Right? They love that. Wasn't there ten of you? See, this man knew he could not be clean without Jesus. He had a humble heart to come back and give glory to God. That's humility right there. Not only that, he fell down and he just exalted Jesus. You healed me. A saint of humility. So where am I getting at? We need to be humble and meek. See, this is not a label like I explained that we can say. This is something that we have to proclaim in our actions we have to have our heart show through our actions that we are humble and meek. See, as we learned in James, James says, right? Prove it by living an honorable life. Guys, you aren't humble and meek overnight. You can't just pray, humble me, Lord. Well, he will, right? I, I ask you all to ask him to humble you, but I also ask you to pray for strength because he will humble you, and you're going to need God's strength in that moment, right? But it doesn't come overnight. We have to practice this. We have to do it. And as we practice, you know, we try to make a habit. Making a habit actually takes you to do said thing, and it takes a little bit of time, right? When you practice a habit, a habit transforms into a lifestyle, right? So we need to make our hearts to be meek as a lifestyle. Strength under control. How do you know if there's a wolf dressed in sheep's clothing? Hmm? What a big snout he has? Yeah. What if he's wearing a sheep mask? Because sheep have snouts too. Right? But let's think about this guy spiritually. Every church is going to have a wolf in sheep's clothing at one point in time. In multiple points in time. How do we know to discern a wolf in sheep's clothing versus a sheep that's here to receive word from the shepherd? A humble and meek heart. That's how you know. You know if that sheep is willing to serve in the situations that is being called upon or if that sheep is just adding fuel to the fire. Because you will see it. That's how you discern it. Guys, don't be that person that someone is discerning you as a wolf. 
If that's you, go home and pray. Spend time with the Lord. We can't just be praying to God on Sundays, everybody. This altar, it, even though it's even open right now, but your altar should be at home too. Your altar is yourself. You need to be spending time with God every day of your life. That is being humble. That is being meek. Coming every Sunday to spend time with God, I'm sorry, but I'm going to proclaim you have to work on yourself. Just being honest. We all fall into this. I'm not perfect, right? So, meekness is not a weakness. Meekness is strength under control. Strength that defines all odds. Strength that is a supernatural coming in that very moment. See, I, I'm going to use one more analogy and I'll be done, I promise. Is I used to run cross country a lot in high school. This guy over there got me into it. And I loved it. I really did. I wasn't the greatest at it, but I loved it. I loved running away and coming back. And knowing now, it honestly was me running away from problems and the analogy of me coming back to my problems. But as a cross-country runner, if you have a good coach, you'll be taught that you just can't sprint off the start as fast as possible. Because those people are coughing along up and you're going to pass them eventually. Right? I loved it when I would just start at a moderate pace. Now, I wasn't like, I'm going to win this race. I think the closest I ever came to winning was 12th in conference, my last race, right? That was a good race. But I didn't sprint. From my teachings in my last race, I just jogged away. I'm pretty sure I was like 70th out of like 150 kids for conference D1. But what I did is I knew when I had to overtake. I knew my strengths. I knew my body and I knew my capabilities. I knew that I loved hills. I could win on the hill. If there was uphill or downhill, I'm winning. So that's when I took my shot. I went uphill fast. I went downhill and used my momentum. I saved my energy. And at the end, I went from being like 70 or 80th and I won at 12. That was awesome. I got a medal. I felt great. That is how God calls us to walk spiritually. That is having strength under control. Not our control, but God's control. See, God is going to tell us when we need to lift that finger. When we need to lift somebody up. When we need to do the work of the kingdom. That is strength under control. Because I tell you what, when God tells you to do something, you might not like it. You're going to suffer physically, mentally, because of it. But if you're in Him, He doesn't give us suffering. But when you're in Him, you're going to be joyful doing it. You're going to love it because you're showing God's love. That is being meek. That is having strength under control of our Father. See, if we had strength, and let's say I'm, I have all this spiritual strength, and somebody... You know, I'm just going to imagine there's somebody here, and I'm going to say his name is, i got to pick a name who's not named in here, Willie. Billy. Okay, is there a Billy in here? Good, good. So Billy, right here, he's having some financial issues, right? And let's just imagine that I don't have any financial issues, and i got millions of dollars in the bank. <laughs> right? I know he's struggling. I know he's struggling. My power, pull, and strength is finances. So I'm going to throw him a million dollars. That would be nice, right? But guess what? Billy doesn't know how to use finances. Billy blows all his money on gambling because we know secretly he'd had a gambling problem. Billy now lost his family because I used all my strength on Billy and he blew away a million dollars. Strength under control. Just because you have a power pull of strength doesn't mean you need to just blast it. Just because you have the ability to fill a need doesn't mean you need to be that person. Now, I'm not saying don't fill a need, guys. Fill a need, right? If there's a need, fill a need. But what you need to do to fill that need is to ask the Father, is this a need for me to fill? 
right? And then listen. Right? We like to pray, Father God, is this a need? Okay, I'm going on with my day. Thank you. That's not a conversation. But we ask the Father, is this a need? And He will pull us to fill that need. Strength under control. Remember, guys, the meek will inherit the kingdom of God. And to show that you are meek is to be a servant of the Lord. And to be a servant of the Lord, you need to receive from the Lord. God is above us. God works on us. And God works through us in all things. Amen.